Hello, welcome to United Church Online. It's so good to see you and it's so good to have you with us. We have got an exciting service planned today. We are wrapping up our series on prayer. Church, we hope this has been encouraging for you. We hope you've learned a lot. We believe that prayer is really something we can all grow in together. And so today we'll be exploring the third week of our prayer series. And we trust that this week will really, really, really be encouraging for you. Stick around, hang out, enjoy it. We're going to get into a time of worship but before we do that, let us pray together. God, we thank you so much for the privilege we have of coming together. The church, the body of Jesus. May we never forget why we gather and why we do what we do. May you be with us today. May you bless us. May we encounter you in every way. May worship set us free. May it lift us up. Um, may, it, may there be a moment where we encounter who you are and what you have for us. We pray this in your name. Amen. Have an amazing service.
Yours is the kingdom, yours is the glory. 
What an encouraging time of worship. I want to encourage you today with this verse, church. Psalm 120, verse 1. I took my troubles to the Lord. I cried out to Him, and He answered my prayer. As we are in the midst of a prayer series, I want us to realize that this is especially a great time to bring our troubles to God. Do we feel like we've got the confidence to come before God and lay our troubles before Him? You know, many of us are facing so many challenges, both internally and externally. We are aware that this season has brought so much internal conflict for so many people. Things that we're wrestling with, decisions we need to make, troubles that we're dealing with, thoughts and emotions and all sorts of things. But also external challenges for people trying to find work, for people trying to navigate times with neighbors and all sorts of things. But this is a season where we can bring those troubles to God. We need to find confidence in the presence of God. We need to find confidence in times of worship. It's in those moments where we are encouraged uplifted and in those moments where God gives us strength to endure what we are facing. And so today, let this be a reminder to bring your troubles to God. And like the psalmist said, and he answered my prayer. God will answer us. God will be faithful to his word. God will answer us as we reach out to him. We are confident of this today. Let us pray before we continue. God, we thank you that you hear our prayers that our prayers do not fall on deaf ears, that our prayers do not fall on the ears of a God who is distant, but you are near, you are close, you are present. And so as we lay our troubles before you, may you hear us and may you answer. We pray that you bring healing on the inside and clarity on the outside. We pray for those who need to make decisions. May you give them wisdom and guidance. We pray for those who are wrestling with internal conflict. May you bring peace and may you bring hope. We know that there is always peace and hope in your presence and so we pray for that today in Jesus name God I pray that as we go out and do what you have called us to do may we do so with confidence knowing that you are on our side we pray this in your name amen amen hey we trust that you are encouraged today church is always an amazing opportunity to have our spirits lifted to have our faith challenged and for us to be reminded as to why we believe why we do what we do why we look to the word of god for strength and comfort because in the word of god we are reminded of why god is good and sometimes i know that we can lose hope sometimes we can get discouraged sometimes we can forget why but we are reminded today that god is good and we can bring our troubles before him well, if you are joining us for the first time, then a massive welcome to you. We trust that God would speak to you today. We trust that God would be with you. And we trust that this would be an opportunity for you to encounter 
him. And so, hey, if this is your first time with us, then we would love to get to know you better. Why don't you go ahead and fill in our digital connect card? Because that's a great opportunity for us to get in touch with you and also for you to get the information that you need about United Church. Maybe you're visiting from out of town. Maybe you're checking us out online before you make a decision to come in person. Whatever the reason, that's okay. You've got the freedom to just sit back and enjoy the service with us today. And we really trust that this will be a moment where God would speak to you. Just a few things to remember, church. Next week is Easter, Friday and Easter Sunday. And so we'll be having our services on Friday right here at church in person. Go ahead and register for the service. But more importantly, invite someone. Register for someone else and just tell them, I've registered you, why don't you come? Because this is a great chance for people to get to know who Jesus is. And then on Easter Sunday, we'll be having our outdoor family service. This will happen at the old Vol Sports Ground right up the road from church. And so you'll see Joanne speak about that in just a few minutes. It is my privilege for now to receive the offering. This is the portion in our service church where we are reminded as to why we give. It's something we fully believe in. And being a church that is invested means being a church that invests practically and spiritually into our church and our community. And you might know that practical investment means financial investment as well. So let me read a short verse and encourage us today. Matthew chapter 6 verse 31 from the Amplified Version says this, Therefore, do not worry or be anxious, perpetually uneasy or distracted, saying what will we eat or what are we going to drink or what are we going to wear? For the pagan Gentiles eagerly seek after these things. But do not worry, for your heavenly Father knows that you need them. But first and most importantly, seek or aim at or strive after His kingdom and His righteousness, His way of doing and being right, the attitude and character of God. And all of these things will be given to you. What I love about this verse is it reminds us not to worry. And let's be honest, it's around the end of the month and this is normally when we start to worry. This is when the debit orders start to go off and we start to think about all the things we need to do and all the things we need to pay. But let me remind you, church, that our hope is in God. We aren't distracted by everything that needs to be done. Like the scripture says, what shall we eat? What shall we drink? What shall we wear? It says the Gentiles, the pagans, those who don't believe in Jesus, they worry about these things. As Jesus followers, we keep our eyes focused. We return to God what is God's and thereafter we take care of our needs confidently. And when we do this, when we get over the worry element of things, we can confidently invest into God's kingdom. We know that we can do what God has called us to do and the church can progress and our community can be empowered and uplifted as we invest here and now. So let me encourage you church, do not worry. Like the verse I read earlier, bring your troubles before God, trust God and then apply His principles. Apply the principle of tithing, apply the principles of generosity because as we do this, we see God work in and through us. I trust that you are encouraged by this this morning. I'm going to pray and then a short video on how you can give will come up on the screen. God, we thank you that in this time you can equip us to be your church. May this be a moment where as we bring back what belongs to you, the tithe, and as we act in generosity, may we see your church flourish. God, we thank you for each and every person who has given sacrificially of their finance to make this church what it is. May it continue to be a light unto others. May we continue to be a city on a hill, a light to the other nations. And may we be a church that is an example as to what it means to live generously. We pray this in your name. Amen. Amen.
Hey everyone! Now that we're meeting in in-person services, we want you to share something with you that's been in our hearts for quite some time. Yes, as a part of making 2021 a year for others, which is the vision for this year, we are excited to begin working on the United Foundation, which is going to be the avenue through which we channel our community impact. So to start this all off, we're going to be launching the United Foundation store. Yes, right here in this very space of the church. So we'll be selling resources and merchandise. And the proceeds will go towards our community impact projects. So here are three ways that you can contribute. First and foremost, you can pray with us. Secondly, you can give towards the United Foundation. And thirdly, you can sign up to serve here in the store. And hey church, we are so excited. Why don't you journey with us as we make 2021 a year for loving, reaching and discipling others. We look forward to it. Keep your eyes peeled. Good morning, United Church. Easter is coming up and we have some exciting things planned. On Good Friday, we will be having two services at 8 and 10 a.m. And for Easter Sunday, we will be having a family picnic at the Old Baltonian Sports Ground. So bring friends and family and some snacks. Unfortunately, we will not be allowed to bring drinks on the sports ground. However, drinks will be available for purchase on the premises. We will also be having a baptism on the day. So if you would like to be baptized, please go to the info desk and sign up. If you're watching online, please use our WhatsApp details and get into contact with us. We are so excited to spend Easter together. Good morning and welcome to this week's Mythbusters Prayer Edition. This week we'll be covering tone of voice. We know that prayer can be challenging. For instance, some people believe that our prayers will only be heard when we activate our <clears throat> prayer voice. Want God to answer a little bit sooner? Why not slap on a quiver or change your accent? Apparently, this gets God's attention. But we're here to bust this myth. See, church, prayer is more about the fancy words or the change in our voice when we meet with Him. We are here to speak to God in a way that's authentic and in a way that honors Him. Real people meeting and speaking to a real God. And remember, prayer is the pathway to discovering the heart of God. Hello and welcome to United Church Online. It's so good to see you. So good to have you with us. Hey, before we begin, I just want to mention firstly, I hope you paid attention to what's happening over Easter. Two Easter Friday services and then finally our Easter Sunday family gathering outdoors. So we've got space. We can come with our families, have a beautiful service and then enjoy some lunch together. Um, and so, hey, let me encourage you to please, please, please diarize it and then also invite someone. If you've got family coming in from out of town, invite them along. Don't be like, oh, I can't bring them. No, bring them. Bring them especially for that because it's going to be an amazing time. We're going to have some amazing things for families and for kids. And so we truly look forward to it. And also we'll be having baptism. And so if you haven't yet been baptized, make this a priority. We're going to be baptizing each other or rather others outdoors on Easter Sunday. What a beautiful way to celebrate the resurrection and to symbolize the resurrection of us from death into life. Great. Let us get straight into it. I'm going to pray, and then we will get into the message today. God, we thank you so much for the privilege we have of coming together, of watching your message, and being encouraged by it. May this bring us life and hope, and may it draw us closer to you. May we learn how prayer can be a pathway to discovering your heart. May we learn to discover your heart as we lay our hearts before you. Today, as we learn about praying for others, may you instill within us a value for praying for others, for praying for others to discover you. We pray this in your name. Amen. Amen. So, we kicked off week one with discovering what, how prayer leads to um, God's heart, and how prayer can be a form of glorifying and exalting God. Last week, we spoke about the seven different forms of of prayer. And I think, I just want to mention, this is not definitive. Obviously, there are more that I just didn't get time to mention because of time. However, we need to understand these are just a guideline that moves us forward in holistic prayer. 
And so it's amazing to know that as you and I engage in this, um, and we engage in those seven forms of prayer, that we grow more holistic in our prayer lives. We ensure that prayer doesn't just become the divine shopping list we bring before God and say, hey, do all of these things for me. But through prayer, we can learn to exalt God and petition and lament and give thanks. And so all of these working together form a holistic picture of what prayer should look like. And so today we're wrapping up with what it means to pray for others. And the reason is because our prayers should not start and end with us. Our prayers should never start and end with us. If we are going to be people who is upward-minded but outward-focused, then our prayers need to have an outward focus as well. Our prayers need to be centered, yes, on us, but also on others. See, if prayer reflects our hearts or if prayer reflects our values and we value people, then it needs to be seen in our prayers as well. We need to set time aside to pray for others. Not just one or two minutes and not just in traffic when you're like, God, I pray that this person moves out of my way. Not like that, but I mean genuinely praying for others, praying for their well-being, praying for them to know God, praying for their future, praying for their protection, praying for them. This is one of the things Jesus instructs us to do when he teaches us how to pray in Matthew chapter 6. In Matthew 6, from verse 10, from verse 9, it says, Pray like this, our Father in heaven, may your name be kept holy. We spoke about that part in, in week one. Then it, go, it goes, may your kingdom come and may your will be done on earth as in heaven. As in heaven. Have you ever thought about what it means when you pray, let your kingdom come? It's normally something we pray because, you know, we were taught the Lord's Prayer as children, but we've never really given thought to what we are saying. When we pray, your kingdom come, we are praying that God's kingdom be established. God's kingdom is centered on God's rule and reign over our lives and the lives of others. So we are praying that God's kingdom be ushered in here and now. Not that one day we'll get there. Yes, we know we're going to spend eternity with God, but we are also praying that that would happen right here and right now. So we are praying that not only ourselves, but others would experience the rule and reign of God, that His power would come down and empower us to be who He's called us to be and to live the lives He's called us to live. See, on this earth, we are separated by all sorts of things, by color and creed, and nationality, and gender, and language, and social status. There's every reason to separate and divide people. But in the kingdom of God, there is unity where people come together under the lordship of Jesus. This is why we believe so much in the heart behind United Church, to unite people into God's kingdom, for others to experience who God is, and the power that He has for them, and for them to come to know Him as Lord and as Savior. That is what it means to pray for the kingdom of God. And so to pray that God's kingdom come is to pray for others. Inasmuch as we have discovered the love and mercy and power of Jesus for others to encounter what we have encountered as well. See, while the world separates by all sorts of other things, everybody has a seat at the table in the kingdom of God. And our prayers need to reflect this that everybody have a seat at the table, that anyone, rich and poor, young and old, the, the, the popular and the marginalized, whatever that looks like, whatever the spectrum, that all would find commonality and favor and acceptance in the kingdom of God. And so to pray for the establishment of God's kingdom is to pray for others. So you might know this, and if you haven't yet, if you may be new to United Church. The vision of, for this year, the focus for this year, is to make 2021 a year for others. And we put three focuses in place, and we did this in the beginning of the year before we began to meet in person. And so maybe you've seen it, maybe you haven't. But the three core focuses are for you and I to move toward a place where we can love others practically, to love others practically. And we are doing this right now with the establishment of the United Foundation store. And so you'll see when you do come to church again, you'll see that we are setting up a specific store with all the proceeds being sold there going towards our community impact. Why? Because we want to practically love others. Not just say that we love others, but we want to love others 
practically. And so all of our resource will be channeled through a, uni- through a United Foundation store. The second focus is to disciple others to being mature believers in Jesus, to disciple others. And so this year, you'll see a stronger emphasis on the Grow College. In fact, we've already started with three different courses, with the story of marriage, with wholeness, and the wilderness course. And all of these are geared towards discipling us closer to Jesus in our marriages, in our wilderness seasons, but also in our emotional and spiritual wholeness. And so there'll be a strong emphasis on that this year. And then finally, the third focus is to reach others with the good news of Jesus. What does this mean? To simply share the gospel of Jesus with those who don't know him yet. And so that's a strong focus for this year. And so this message is centered around that that specific value this year for you and I to move towards reaching others with the good news of Jesus. And when I say reaching others, it's not simply just doing good for them, but it's actually seeking for others to come to know God, seeking for others to know Jesus as their Savior. Why? Because if you and I, or you and I will never reach others if we don't start by praying for others. We'll never reach others if we don't start by praying for others. Another way of saying it is this way. The first step to reaching someone is to pray for them. The first step to reaching someone is to pray for them. And so if prayer is the pathway to discovering the heart of God, then prayer needs to be the pathway where we discover God's heart for others as well. See, if we can understand, if we can adopt the lens, if we can view it through the lens of God's heart for others, we'll be less tempted to build or hold grudges and put up walls, and we'll be more tempted or more encouraged to build longer tables and welcome others, and especially those we don't always agree with, who we see as problematic or troublesome. Maybe they could just be hurt and broken people in desperate need of the Savior. We need to be praying for God to show us who the people are in our lives that need Him desperately, and then have the courage to share that with them. And so we're going to read from 1 Timothy. Like I said in the beginning, we need to learn to pray from Scripture so we know how to pray for others. And so 1 Timothy, Paul writes about how you and I can pray for people. We'll read it from the NLT, and then we'll dissect it a bit from the Amplified Version. And so 1 Timothy chapter 2 Verse 1 to 4, I urge you, I encourage you, first of all, to pray for all people. There's the instruction. We can end that verse right there, and we're done. Pray for all people. That's the instruction. It is to be obeyed and not just considered. That's what you and I should be doing. It continues, though. Ask God to help them. Intercede on their behalf. Give thanks for them. Pray this way for kings and all who are in authority, so that we will live peaceful and quiet lives marked by godliness and dignity. This is good and pleases God, our Father, who wants everyone to be saved and to understand the truth. Church, that is why we do what we do, so that others are saved and they can understand the truth. That right there should be the motivation why we pray for others and why you and I pursue prayer for others. See, praying for others is a command from Scripture, not an option that we get to pick and choose. Paul instructs us, pray for all people. And so if you and I have been instructed to do so, then let us take the charge or let us take take this instruction and run with it. And so let's break it up and look at what this means for you and I. In the Amplified Version, it says this, first First of all, then I urge you that petitions or specific requests, remember that was one of the forms of prayer we spoke about last week, petitions, prayers, intercession, which is prayer for others, and thanksgiving be offered on behalf of all people, for kings and all who are in positions of high authority, so that we may live peaceful and quiet lives in all godliness and dignity. This kind of praying is good and acceptable and pleasing in the sight of God our Savior, who desires all people to be saved and to come to the knowledge and recognition of the divine truth. What does it mean when we pray for petitions, prayers, and intercessions? Like I said last week, petitions are prayers where we bring our requests before God, but this time on behalf of others. So we are petitioning before God, not just for ourselves. And you and I need to caution against just bringing requests for only 
ourselves. God, this is my list. This is what I need you to do for me. See, what prayer for others does, it expands our world. It expands our world. It helps us see that there's more to life than just our needs, our wants, and our requests. Petitions for others is what brings us back to humility, realizing that it's not just about us. And so, hey, church, let me encourage you. Who are the people in your life that you can petition for? In your workplace, in your varsity, in your school, in your class, in your family, who are the people that you can bring to God and say, God, not only for me, but for them, this is what I ask for. We've got a list of people that we pray for, and and it's so beautiful to know that, hey, I'm praying for what you are trusting God for, I'm praying for that as well. If I've got a friend who's looking for a job, I'm praying for them to find a job too. If I've got a friend who's, who's searching for something, who's really trusting God for breakthrough, then I too am praying that they would discover God's breakthrough. You and I can make requests to God on behalf of others. Then it says, Prayers and intercessions. Um, The word intercession means to intervene on behalf of others. To intervene on behalf of others. And what this means is, it also, once again, it takes the focus off us, and it helps us realize that you and I can stand in the gap on behalf of someone else. And so essentially what it means is to be a bridge between someone else and God. That I can stand in the gap and say, God, On behalf of them, I pray that you would hear me for them. I mean, how amazing is that? That you can stand in the gap, that you can be the bridge to help someone else encounter God through your prayers. How powerful is this, church? It's not just God remove them or God bless them. Specific requests that you can make on behalf of someone else. This leads us to praying selfless prayers beyond just ourselves. He then goes on to say, and he says, pray this way for kings and those in authority. Here's the challenging part. Because South Africans have a very unique relationship with authority. Let's be honest. We don't, when we pray for authority, we don't usually pray for authority in a good way. When we pray for authority, we pray that God would remove authority, right? Let's be honest. When we think of authority and we think of, you know, governmental leaders or national leaders or those in authority over the country, our first prayer is like, God, take them away. <laughs> Let's be honest. That is how we think as South Africans. We need to confront it so that we can do better. We can pray for the well-being of those in authority even when we are not in agreement with them. Did you know that? Did you know that you can pray for someone even though you don't fully agree with them yet? You know what that's called? That's called humility. That means that I set my perspectives, my pride, my desires aside and still see the dignity of the humanity that God has placed within them, even though I don't agree with their decision, they are still a human being who God loves and wants to reach. Therefore, I will still pray for them. Church, this is powerful. This is what will change our nation. When Christians, Jesus followers like you and me, put aside our political preference, our national preference, our decisions, or whatever else, and we say, I look at that person as a human being who God loves and wants to save. If we can't see people that way, we we will forever uh, prevent ourselves from reaching others. I'm getting passionate. You can hear it in my voice, can't you? This church is what will change our nation. When you and I can pray for those in authority, pray earnestly, honestly, and wholeheartedly. Not just pray prayers of God, remove them, but pray that God, may you open up their eyes. May you reveal yourself to them. May you give them wisdom to lead our nation well. May you uplift them so that they can be good examples of what it means to lead. This church is what changes things. So when we are called to pray for authority, let us carry that task as a privilege, not as a burden. We get to lift up those in authority over us, both nationally but spiritually as well. We get to lift them up in prayer and trust that God would lead them as they lead us. Do we really believe that God can change the hearts of our leaders? See, if we don't believe that, then we will have no reason to pray for them. And if we have no reason to pray for them, things will never change. And maybe you've come to believe that. 
that things will never change. And because you believe that narrative, you just think, oh, well, I'm not even going to bother praying for them because things will never change. Church, let us change that narrative. Let us change that kind of thinking. And let's believe that change is possible when you and I engage in prayer, when us as Jesus followers engage in prayer, that God would intervene, shift people's hearts, shift political leaders' hearts so that they've got our best interests at heart. Proverbs teaches us that the heart of the king is in the hand of God. It is like streams of water in the hand of God, meaning that God has the power to change their hearts and their inclinations. I believe when Scripture says that, I hope you can do. And then it continues. This kind of prayer is good and pleasing to God. What kind of prayer? All of these kinds of prayers, petitioning for others, interceding for others, giving thanks for others, praying for leaders, all of these types of prayer. This is what God wants. It is good and it pleases God. Did you know that when you pray for others, God is pleased? Think about that. When you pray for others, God is pleased. Please, when we pray for others and, look and bring them before God and lift them up and put our own preferences and needs aside just for a second, I'm not saying don't pray for yourself or don't bring your needs. I'm saying when we can just put that aside for a second and bring others before God, God is pleased. Why? Because that repositions the position of our hearts. It shifts our values. It does more for us than what we realize. It does more for us than what we realize. And here's what we learn from this, and you've heard me say this before. You cannot hate someone who you are laboring in prayer for. Think about that. You can't despise someone. You can't be jealous of someone. You can't envy someone. You can't, none of that. You can't do that when you are laboring in prayer for them. For as long as you are laboring in prayer for them, you have their best interest at heart. Whether they've done you wrong, whether they've treated you badly, whether they've committed an injustice towards you, for as long as you are praying for them, you want God to reach them. You have their best interest at heart. I'm not saying don't be wise and don't place boundaries where boundaries are needed. Sometimes we do need to do that. But by and large, you and I sometimes are unjustified in the discouragement or the disliking or the envy or the jealousy we have towards others. Whereas if we can simply just pray for them, it changes our, our perspective towards them. And the reason is this. Paul ends it off with this section. For God desires for all to be saved. Do we believe that sometimes the people that we come across, the people in our workplaces, the people in our family members, the ones we get along with and the, or the don't, ones we don't get along with, that the people who frustrate us and annoy us, that God wants them too to be saved? Do we believe that the people in our community who sometimes frustrate us, you know those loud neighbors that live across from you? You know those ones in your complex that you sometimes just drive past and they never greet you and you never greet them because once upon a time this and this happened and you guys just aren't on speaking terms? You know those people in your workplace who when you walk past their office you walk a little bit faster because you kind of don't want to stop there because they just want more of you than what you want to give? You know those people too? Do you believe that they too want to be saved? You believe that God wants all people to be saved. See, God's heart for people, if prayer is a pathway to discovering God's heart, God's heart is for all to be saved. That means that your heart and my heart then needs to be for all others who don't know God to be saved as well. That changes the way we pray for them, doesn't it? See, the church isn't just meant to be the organization that does good works. And that's an important part of the church. We are meant to take care of the poor and the widows and the marginalized. We are meant to do this. That's our commission. But our first and foremost priority, the primary role of the church, is to expand God's kingdom by reaching those who don't yet know Him. And sometimes, because people don't understand, understand this, they misunderstand the purpose of the church. They think the church is only meant to do good works, and we don't worry about praying for others or reaching others or discipling others or getting people saved. That's secondary to doing good works. No, it is the other way around. First and foremost, for people to be saved and to come to know God as their Lord and Savior. Then to do good unto others. It's not an either or, it's a both and. But our primary priority is to expand God's kingdom to the salvation of souls. That is what we are called to do as the church. 
here's, here's a hard truth. We can do all the good works we want, but if we are not leading people to Jesus, we are not fulfilling our mission. See, we can do all the good works, all the philanthropic work, all the social justice work, all the good things that we want to do. But if people aren't getting saved and coming to know Jesus, we are not fulfilling our mission. Think about it. Matthew chapter 28. Go out into all the world and make disciples of all nations. Teaching them what? Teaching them just to give out money to the poor? No. Teaching them to obey my commands. That is what Jesus had called us to do. Over and above that, we begin to do good because of what God has done for us. The good works flow from once we have discovered who God is to us, not just for gaining favor with God. See, it's not an either or. It is a both and. Church, our prayers needs to be, your, your prayer and my prayer needs to be that God would give us a desire to pray for others. If you don't have that desire, then pray first and foremost for you to have the desire to pray for others, to pray for your family, those in your family, either immediate or extended family who don't know, you, who don't know God yet. Pray for colleagues, pray for neighbors, pray for community members, pray for leaders, to pray for others earnestly and honestly and wholeheartedly and confidently. That needs to be the desire of our hearts. See, if we don't have that desire to begin with, we'll never get to a place where we see that happen. It needs to be a part of our values to want to see others changed and saved for Jesus. See, church, our families need our prayers. You can stand in the gap. You can stand on behalf of your family if they don't yet know Jesus or if they are trusting for breakthrough. You can be the avenue that stands in the gap for others. Our families need our prayers. Church, our community needs our prayers. As much as they need our good work and our investment, they need our prayers as well because there are families in our communities that are suffering, that are in torment, that are hurting and are broken. And yes, we can do good works, but ultimately some of them just need to know Jesus. So they need our prayers as well. Our schools need Jesus. If you've ever spent some time learning about what happens in our local schools, trust me, they need our prayers. They need our prayers now more than ever. If I look at what young people are engaging in, in our local school, my schools, my heart begins to break. My heart begins to break for our young people and the future that awaits them if they keep on going on the trajectory they are going. Our schools need our prayers. Our university needs our prayers. Church, our government needs our prayers. More than they need us to complain about them. More than they need our rebellion. More than they need any of this. They need us to pray for them, because we believe that prayer is powerful and that prayer works. Our children need our prayers. So church, the task that is upon us to pray for others is a great privilege, not a burden and not a weight. It is a privilege. Let us treat it as such. And if we can engage in it on an individual level, but on a corporate level as well, we begin to stir ourselves up to, to expect the change that we are praying for. See, we cannot be passive any longer. We are called to advance God's kingdom. Your kingdom come. It won't just come and fall into our laps. We need to advance it. We need to pursue it, and we pursue it through the power of prayer. That is what we are called to do. James chapter 5, 16, as I prepare to wrap up, says this, confess your sins to each other and pray for each other so that you may be healed. There's power in collective prayer for one another. Why? Because it heals us of our sins, of our offenses towards one another, of our discouragement, of our grumpiness, of our unforgiveness. All of these things that fester within, praying for one another brings healing for all of that. It goes on. The earnest prayer. That is the goal of the series, remember? To pray earnestly confidently, remember? So the earnest prayer of a righteous person has great power and produces what? Wonderful results. The earnest prayer of a righteous person has great power. Do you believe that your prayers carry power? Do you believe that when you pray for others that God will hear you and answer? See, if we don't believe that, then we'll, we'll never start in the first place. But if we truly believe 
that the prayer of a righteous person carries power, we will be encouraged to do it so much more. And if you don't have the strength to believe it for for yourself, then let us believe that for you. Church, we want to be the people who stand in the gap on behalf of others. Let us stand in the gap on behalf of others here as well. Because as we believe this and as we engage in it, it begins to change us. It has wonderful results. See, here's, wrapping up, here's the reason why we pray for others. Luke chapter 5, oh sorry, Luke chapter 15, the account of the prodigal son. When the son goes away, takes his father's inheritance, goes away and squanders it, finds himself living in a pigsty, literally. Some people find themselves there emotionally and spiritually. And they just think they, their actions, that they, they do what they feel is best for them. And yet their decisions bring them to a place where they are feeling empty and hurt and lost and broken. There are so many prodigal sons in our society right now. And eventually God leads him back home. And we need to trust that God would lead the prodigals back home. But here's what I love. In verse 24, the father finally welcomes him in, embraces him, and this is what he says. This son of mine was dead and has returned to life. He was lost, and now he is found. And so the party began. Church, for you and I, we need to understand that there is so much power and value for every one person who was dead and is now alive, who was lost and is now found. This is why we fully believe that those who don't yet know Jesus are truly lost. And many people might see that as offensive, but we just see it as an opportunity to invite them back home. Will you take up the challenge? And pray for those who don't yet know Jesus to be found and to be brought back to spiritual life. Let that be our goal today. And hey, if you are watching and you are maybe on the fringes of Christianity and this is your story, if you are watching and you are finding yourself on the fringes, looking in from the outside and your life or your decisions has gotten you to a place where you are feeling empty, broken, hurt, and lost, and that you just need direction, more than direction, that you actually just need a Savior. That is who Jesus is. And that is why we worship Him, because He, at one point in our lives, was the Savior that we needed when we were lost, hurting, and broken. And if He was that for us, He can be that for you too. That is actually the reason why we commemorate and celebrate Easter, because of what Jesus has done for us. And so if you are that person, I would love to pray for you today. Wherever you are, why don't you join me in this prayer? Just raise your hands, pour your heart out before God, and let's pray together. Father God, for every person watching who is on the fringes, who's finding themselves broken, hurting, confused, and lost, may you be their Savior. May you save them from their brokenness. Save them into the new family that you are calling them to be a part of, the church, where we love care for, and have best intentions for one another. May they recognize their deep-rooted need for a Savior. May they recognize that they are in deep need for you. May they recognize that without you, our future is only one of confusion, hurt, and brokenness. May you give them life, and the life in abundance that you have promised in John chapter 10. May they come to know you, love you, honor you, and serve you. Give us, as Jesus followers, a heart to pray for others. In your name we pray. Amen. Amen. What an amazing decision that is. If you've made that decision today, then our heart is to lead you, as Jesus said, to disciple you and teach you about what Jesus expects. And so why don't you get in touch with us? A WhatsApp number is appearing on the screen right now. Drop us a message. Otherwise, visit our website or just drop us an email at hello at unitedchurch.org.za. We would love to get in touch with you and help you take your next steps. Until next week, church, next week is Easter. Can you believe it? It's only a week away. Invite someone. Invite them to be a part of the family. Think about a neighbor. Think about a colleague. Take up the challenge and invite them into a meaningful life with Jesus. And that starts with acknowledging Him as our Savior. And so, bring them to Easter services, bring them to Easter Sunday, invite them to the family picnic, and let us celebrate for every person that comes back home.
In Jesus' name, amen. Have a phenomenal week. See you next week, Sunday.